Thank you very much. I will do what I always do when I take the podium. I will lower the microphone. Five foot eight is what you get, of course. So there you go. Um, thank you, Sid. Thank you, Ann and Doug. And how about that talented young poet, of course? I can't recall what I was doing when I was 16, but it was not writing poetry. I mean, I'm sure of that. So he's already ahead of the game, naturally. Uh, a few thanks on my end as well, of course, for a few folks. Um, one, of course, uh, Doug and Ann Stanton. They're not only uh, great pillars of this community and have packed your house many times for events like this, uh, they're also great role models and friends for my wife, Christy, and I, uh, real heroes of ours, to say the least. Uh, the staff, the volunteers here who do amazing work, uh, Horizon Books, who sell these books. Thank you again for that, and brilliant books as well. Uh, yes, Best of Bacon is out. I believe my friend Bob Spence is here. He would tell you that Best of Bacon is oxymoronic, nonetheless. <laughs> or alternatively, a pamphlet, but either way. So keep those moving. Uh, radio friends, Ron Jolly at WTCM, of course. The Omelette uh, on the Bear, and Jason and Jim and WKLT. We hit them all this morning, uh, which, again, your city supports this. Uh, that's a big deal, naturally. Um, my TC mentor is Roy Bowles, has worked here for four decades or so. He's my ninth grade Bantam coach. I've got a lot of mentors and friends here in Traverse City. I've got the Child's family, surrogate parents of mine who got me playing hockey. Uh, Dave Stringer, my high school coach, lives at, lives at Cordia, actually. My high school, I'm sorry, English teacher. Uh, Bob Giles, publisher of the Detroit News, he's here tonight as well. All great mentors of mine, all great friends, and also to Traverse City itself. Uh, next only to Ann Arbor, where I was born and raised, this is our home, essentially. We get about 1,000 in Ann Arbor. We got about 550 here in Traverse City. You guys top Chicago, LA, New York, and our books. Uh, we do well in those places, but not as well as we do here. If we all write these books, but you guys don't show up, it does not count for much. Uh, we need people to buy them. We need people to show up. These, these events are really a drag with no one in the audience, as you might imagine. And I've done that, by the way. So. If you've not played the Sam's Club in Saginaw, Michigan, you don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna call that a low moment in my career. I recall sitting there with a rack of Bose Lasting Lessons, which ultimately sold very well, but at that point it wasn't selling, and I saw a guy in one of those scooters with Michigan bumper stickers all over it, U of M football, blah, 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 rolled past me without even looking at me, and that's when I realized it's not gonna work for me here in Saginaw Sam's Club, so. So this is a whole lot better. Thank you for that. Uh, and for that, truly, uh, I'm doing what I love for a living. That's a rare, rare opportunity. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up. So first question is, how do you go from writing football books to writing about the great Halifax explosion? A century ago, of course, and it's a bit of a winding path. Uh, it's a family history for me. Uh, the Bacon side of the family and the you side of the family, and I never give up that middle name, of course. It's too much fun to drag it out. Uh, popular guesses include, uh, everyone always guesses Ulysses first. That's false. Um, then they scratch their heads and give up and guess unicorn, underwear, or umbrella. <laughs> the less enlightened will guess Eugene. <laughs> I knew you guys would get that one. <laughs> you guys read books. Appreciate that. I'm always curious about, you know, U hyphen J-E-A-N, like U-Haul, make your own denim store. What is Eugene with a U? I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, so the U side of the family uh, went north to uh, New Brunswick uh, during the Revolutionary War. So uh, my mom was born and raised in New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, so therefore, I am, in fact, half Canadian bacon. <laughs> this book has not got a lot of jokes in it, so this is... This is how we're going to front load this one. So. Um, so my mom grew up in a town called Milltown, New Brunswick, right on the border across the Bay of Fundy uh, from uh, Calais, Maine. Not Calais, but Calais is how they pronounce it. Uh, she used to go across the security gates uh, to watch a movie in uh, Calais, Maine. It's a very small town. My mom was valedictorian of her high school class, uh, ranked number one in the class. However, the class was seven people. <laughs> so she was not in the top 10%. The ninth readers didn't get that one today, by the way, so <laughs> thank you. My grandfather was 12 years old, living in New Brunswick in 1917 when this explosion happened. When I was a kid growing up, I'd spent a lot of my summers in New Brunswick. It's beautiful territory. It's kind of like the UP. 
It's uh, hilly and rugged, a lot of rivers, a lot of hunters and fishermen, not a lot of money, but hardworking folks who leave their keys in their trucks like you guys do. Um, and he's always telling me as a kid about this, that this amazing explosion happened, and this one-ton anchor flew three miles that way, and this one-ton cannon flew four miles that way, and it all sounded interesting, and he was not known to be a liar, but I never heard about this anywhere else. Uh, so I just kind of filed it away and didn't know what it all meant until 1999, about 20 years after he first told me about this. I was researching my first book on Michigan hockey called Blue Ice, the story of Michigan hockey, when it turns out the founder of the program was a first responder to the Halifax explosion. And I was talking to his son, then in his 80s, also named Dr. Joseph Bars, also a doctor. And he's telling me about the Halifax explosion. I said, tell me more. And as he's telling me about this, the bells are finally ringing in my head. And I realized that is what my grandfather was talking about. And of course, now we've got the internet in 99, so I look it up and I'll be damned. He wasn't crazy. The anchor did go three miles that way, and the cannon went four miles that way. So that's when I became intrigued about this. And I included a chapter uh, in my first book uh, on the Halifax explosion uh, in Blue Ice. And then finally, 16 years later, had a chance to write a book about it. I pitched this, I forgot about this, in 05. Wrote about 50 pages, and my agent at the time said no, but now I've got a new agent at William Morris, and he said this is a great idea. And Peter Hubbard at HarperCollins agreed it was a great idea, and God bless him, they gave me a contract. And now we have this book out here that uh, was a bestseller last year, it's a hardcover. And we just learned last night it's number six in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes states, number six right now in New England, so the rest of the country needs to catch up to you people, but thank you, obviously, so appreciate that. So uh, that's where the seed was planted for me. In the process, there are three myths I want to pop, basically, in the course of telling the story tonight, and of course, of course, of reading the book, which I hope you all get, of course, um, and they are this. First of all, that the U.S. and Canada we're all, always allies. It's such a non sequitur for us that, uh, of course, they're allies of ours. We don't even think about this. You cross the border. Only recently do you even need a passport, for crying out loud. It is the world's longest undefended border. But we're actually enemies for the first 141 years of our country's history until the Halifax explosion. And the American response to that turned us into allies. And, of course, they're probably our greatest ally for the last 101 years, economically and otherwise. I'll explain later on. But that is a myth, and I was stunned to the degree that we were not allies before this. So stay tuned for that. Two, next myth, that the atomic bomb was unprecedented. And of course, when it was dropped in 1945 on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we think there's no precedent for this. The Halifax explosion was that precedent. It is one-fifth the power of the atomic bomb. And without atomic power, that's pretty incredible in itself. And we know this because the creator of the atomic bomb, Robert Oppenheimer, uh, convened a conference at the University of California in 1942, bringing in the world's best nuclear scientists available to them at the time, all right, to study the Halifax explosion. It was the only precedent they had to try to calculate what is going to happen in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the calculations, of course, proved accurate. So this is a sense, the world's first weapon of mass destruction. Third thing is, third myth I want to pop, when the worst happens, human beings are at their worst. And that is completely false. But you will see again and again and again in the course of the story, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. People who are simple librarians that day or kids going to high school or guys fixing shoes all of a sudden become superheroes uh, by 3 o'clock that afternoon because it was required. Because for people to survive this thing, ordinary people had to rise up and do incredible things. And they did them again and again and again, often at risk of their own lives, occasionally at the loss of their own lives to save people they didn't even know. And that to me is a great story, especially for these times. We're in a turbulent time, obviously, both in the country as well as uh, worldwide. And turn on the TV, you can hear about the bad guys all day long. The snipers, of course, the school shooters, the sexual harassers, and it goes on and on and on, the terrorists, you name it. All right, and I'm getting tired of hearing about the bad guys. They always get the headlines, the nightly news. This story is about the good guys you hear too little about, who rose up and did extraordinary things, and this is about giving them their due. This book is about the good guys who walk the streets every day here in Traverse City and 101 years ago in Halifax. And thanks. Uh, I put that in. The first talk I gave on this was almost exactly a year ago at Rackham Auditorium in Ann Arbor, a crowd like this, about 1,000 folks or so. Um, and I was going over my speech that morning. The first time I gave it was that night, of course. And 
I threw that line in there at the last second, and they did what you did. I uh, gave it an ovation, and that's when I realized how thirsty we are for good news about good people. And I still believe the good people outnumber the bad ones by a long shot, but we need to give them their, their due. So, first things first, Canada. I need to explain Canada. <laughs> Uh, as Al Capone said, Al Capone was accused, accused accurately of running rum, of course, from Canada through the Great Lakes to Chicago. And when he's accused of doing this, his defense was, Canada, I don't even know what street it's on. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> uh, Dave Barry, famous humorist, we're trying to get here in Traverse City, and I think I will at some point. Uh, his line was, Canada's national motto is, technically a nation. <laughs> and my mom, a good Canadian, still laughed at that one, so that's pretty good. Uh, the old joke in Canada, in Canada goes like this, if you want to tell the difference between a Canadian and American, all you have to do is say there is no difference. The American will nod, and the Canada, Canadian will object very politely. <laughs> so where does all that come from? 1776, of course is our Revolutionary War. We call it the War of Independence, the Revolutionary War. They call it a civil war, and they're, act and they're right. It was Britain, British fighting British, technically, until 1776 when we split off. So that's how that war started. The Canadian side of my family, as I told you, 60,000 uh, British, what they called United Empire Loyalists. My dad's side calls them cowards. That's a different story. It depends on who wins the war, right? So uh, 60,000 uh, United Empire Loyalists had their houses burned, were tarred and feathered, some were killed for being loyal to the crown. Uh, so they said, to heck with this, and they bolted north to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and founded those provinces, which are the first settlements, really, in Canada. So Canadians, it's Americans who founded Canada, essentially. Um, so there's a first little tidbit for you there. Second one, the War of 1812. As a friend of mine who played hockey at Michigan and therefore was surrounded by Canadian hockey players, of course, at the U of M, he said, if you have three beers with a Canadian, you will get a different version of the War of 1812. <laughs> I found two beers tends to do it. <laughs> Thanks to my hard-hitting investigative research, which I pursued for this project. Uh, our version goes like this. We only know pretty much two things about the War of 1812. That Fra uh, Francis Scott Key, of course, uh, penned the national anthem during a uh, fight in Baltimore. And of course, the Canadians tried to burn the White House. And those are both largely accurate. The Canadian version goes like this. You guys started it, all right? And you started it by trying to burn not government buildings, but uh, personal homes in what was then called York, uh, uh, Fort York, now called Toronto, uh, and burned down personal homes. And in retaliation only, mind you, uh, this is my mom's version, of course, the Canadians came down to D.C. and tried to burn the presidential mansion, as it was called then, but the damn thing's made of stucco, which does not burn very well. So their scouting report was pretty poor, so they basically charred the sides of the White House extensively for about a day and gave up and went away. Uh, so what happens next? They repainted that building white, and that is why it is called the White House. Next time you use that term, thank your Canadian friends for trying to burn it down. <laughs> the guy who tried to burn that down, General Robert Ross, is buried with great honor and Halifax's main cemetery right downtown, and behind a placard with all the great Canadians of the time buried in this plot, it says on the placard outside this national monument now, why we are not Americans. This is a new placard, man. <laughs> nothing new, uh, nothing old. This is still a question they have. When you go to Atlanta or South Carolina, you can discuss the Civil War anew. Of course, they're still fighting that down there. In Canada, this, this history is still quite fresh, amazingly. So. In that war, a guy named Joseph Bars Jr. Uh, was a privateer. And if you know your history, you know that what is a privateer? It's basically a pirate who is sanctioned by the government to do the exact same job, but split the proceeds with the government. So you, this guy captured, sunk, or burned more than 60 American ships during the, during the War of 1812. He was the most wanted man in America. They had posters of him all over the United States to try to catch this guy. Um, and they finally caught him and put him, uh, brought him back to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where they marched him down Main Street in shackles to humiliate him. They put him in the jail for about two months. They gave him hardtack and water. I ate hardtack uh, as an exercise for this book. It tastes like cardboard, man. I guess it keeps you alive, but that's about all. So they sent him back to Nova Scotia and the promise he would not do it again, and he didn't, uh, but he was the most wanted man in Canada. He happens to be the great-grandfather of the hero of this story. 
uh, the guy who started the Michigan hockey program. So uh, going farther from there, the American Civil War, uh, they were officially neutral. Canada was during the American Civil War, but they were privately, secretly for the South, and especially in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The neighborhood we're going to talk about in Halifax is called Richmond. It is named for Richmond, Virginia. And the reason it's named that is the cotton came from Richmond, and they processed it in factories in uh, Richmond, Nova Scotia. And they put it on ships to go across to uh, England and Europe, and they put it on trains to go across North America. So they cared about Richmond, Virginia. They didn't care too much about the rest of it. And that's where they did their business, basically. So uh, they're partial to uh, the South, and to prove this, a captain named John Taylor Wood was the captain of the CSS Tallahassee. He's the grandson of President Zachary Taylor, the nephew of Jefferson Davis, the first and only president of the Confederacy. This guy is quite a, swash, quite a swashbuckler. He himself had plunked 26 Union ships during the Civil War up and down the Eastern Coast. And so they finally chased him all the way up to Halifax, Nova Scotia, trying to capture him, of course. Halifax happens to be the world's second biggest natural harbor second only to Sydney, Australia. It's a gorgeous town. Get a chance to go there, go there. Don't get the steak, get the fish. That's what these people do, all right? It's a fishing town, get the fish, trust me. Uh, it's really good, but they snuck into Halifax. Canada is technically neutral. So the Union soldiers, the Union ships, had to wait outside the harbor, according to the uh, international code, and wait for these guys to get out. Only one way to get out, they think, all right? But while they're under guard, uh, a guy named Dr. Allman, one of the most respected people in Halifax. He's got Big Street named after him in Halifax. He distracted the Union Guard by punching him in the face and knocking him out cold. <laughs> and that allowed Captain Jack Fleming to board the CSS Tallahassee. Jack Fleming, they said, knew the sea and all the fish in it. He also knew what the Union ship did not know, that at high tide at midnight, on a Tuesday night, you can sneak around the other side of McNeil Island all right, where it's about nine feet deep normally, but 16 feet deep during the high tide. If you know exactly where you're going, you can steer a big ship around the island and get out and get past the Union ship, and they did. They escaped, and they were so upset about this. President Lincoln was so upset about this, they almost declared war against Canada at that moment. We were that close. Canada was almost certain we were going to declare war against Canada throughout the Civil War. In fact, uh, so sure that uh, Seward, Seward's folly is well known, of course, uh, by in Alaska, uh, during that time. He had a proposal formally written for President Lincoln why we should attack a Canada to unify the Americans, uh, to try to end the Civil War that way, use them as a scapegoat basically and attack Canada. All right, President Lincoln wisely, wisely said, this is not your best idea, go see about Alaska. <laughs> but that's how tenuous our relationship was during all this time. You fast forward to 1911, when uh, the Speaker of the House of the U.S. Congress, the Paul Ryan of his day, takes the floor of the U.S. Congress in 1911 and advocates for the violent overthrow of the Canadian government to annex Canada. This is an official policy. He received loud cheers in a room like this and a great write-up in the Washington Post. This is a popular idea and is considered to be inevitable sooner or later with manifest destiny that Americans would do this. That's 1911. World War I breaks out in 1914. The Canadians being British citizens, of course, they join immediately in 1914. Halifax is the spigot for all things leaving North America going to the Great War. Soldiers, uh, sailors, supplies, you name it. Weapons, ships, all that stuff comes out of Halifax. It is the most important port in the world at that point. Uh, and of course, the U.S. did not join until 1917 in the spring. We were latecomers to this thing, and the Canadians, of course, were well aware of that fact. So that's the backdrop for what happens next. Uh, also in the backdrop is the great-grandson of that great privateer. His name is Joseph Ernest Bars, named after the privateer. Um, he, is the, uh, he was a five-foot-eight guy, not very big, very smart. Uh, he learned how to read a newspaper at age four. And by age 19, he already graduated summa cum laude from Acadia University, which his grandfather had founded. He was a four-sport star in football, hockey, baseball, and boxing, trained by a Golden Gloves winner in Canada. So this guy was tough also. Uh, his son told me he could skate without lacing his skates. His ankles were so strong. Keep in mind back then, now you're basically skating in ski boots. Back then, it's more or less leather shoes with a blade on them. So this guy was unusually strong, unusually tough. When he graduates, he decides to go to Montreal where he works for Imperial Oil, making his fortune, rising the ranks very soon, very quickly. He is living the high life. 
Uh, but he feels no sense of purpose. He feels no sense of mission. And that is one of the hallmarks of the Barr's family. His father was a Baptist minister. That is clearly a sense of mission, who was a missionary in India when he was born, when Joseph was born. So that guy's got a sense of mission. His grandfather, as I said, founded Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, where he grew up. His great-grandfather was that famous privateer. All right, these people, different walks of life, have got a strong sense of mission. All Bars is doing, he feels, is earning money and having a good time, but he's not really contributing to a greater cause. The greater cause, of course, comes with the Great War in 1914. He and his rowing buddies are in the Montreal locker room after a regatta, and they're reading the newspaper about the Princess Patricia unit from Canada, which is always the first one in and the last one in, out. And they're getting mowed down, and they're listening to the names of their friends who have been killed. Now, a lot of us would read that and say, I want no part of that. But these guys said, nope, we're signing up tomorrow, and they all did, he and his four buddies. And, of course, Barr's parents were horrified. They're pacifists, mostly. He is the only child they've got. So as a father now of an only child, my wife assures me he's going to be an only child. Uh, she knows more about this than I do. So, uh, yeah, Teddy, three years old, this is a terrifying prospect for me already. I can only imagine how terrified his parents were. But he's all gung-ho. And he's so gung-ho, he signs up to be a machine gunner. Machine gunner is the guy with the tripod, all right, in the back there, pounding away at the Germans. And you get an MG patch on your shoulder. That is considered a suicide patch because if a German soldier captures you, even if you surrender with your hands up, you are not getting, you're not being allowed to surrender. They will kill you on the spot. So you just killed all their friends. All right, so that is a suicide mission. He was so good at this that they wanted to keep him back in England to train the other soldiers, and he lobbied, he begged to make sure he joined his friends over there in the trenches and fight the Germans. He wanted in. And as he wrote to his parents in a letter, and I've got his letters, that's a lucky break, by the way. When you're writing a book like this, the guy wrote beautifully, it's kind of like Forrest Gump. He's wherever my story goes, he and his family go with it. So he's a lucky, lucky thread for me throughout the story. He writes his parents, as you have probably noted, I am full of this thing and cannot wait to get behind the lines. A year later, this war, he realizes, is like Vietnam. No one's going anywhere. You can't push forward. You can't push back. The amount of carnage was incredible. It is the world's ghastliest war to this day. And the reason is simple. Our technology for TNT, for barbed wire, uh, for tanks, for submarines, uh, for trench warfare. Our technology for all these things, for killing, has zoomed. Our technology in medicine has not caught up. So the carnage was incredible uh, during this time. And now he realizes after a year of seeing his friends mowed down, 80% his, uh, of his unit is gone at this point. He writes his friends a year later, in the summer of 1916. He writes, I think we are all heartily sick of the whole show. But he said, it cannot possibly get any worse. And two days later, it does. On June 2nd, 1916, Joseph Ernest Bars is hit by a German shell. He's flown about 50 feet across the field. He's unconscious for hours. His friends think that he's dead, but they've got a motto in the Prince of Patricia. They do not leave a man behind like the U.S. Marines. So they go out there in the killing fields and get him at great risk of their own life and pull him back, and he's still alive, incredibly. He's badly damaged in the spine uh, from being flown across the field. Uh, he can't walk properly. His left foot is paralyzed. He has tremors a year later in his hands. He can't sleep. Uh, his doctors are diagnosing him with what we would now call PTSD in a severe case and tell him he's not going to get better. He's never going to be able to walk properly. He had to struggle to walk with a cane. And that's him back in Halifax in 1917. In November of 1917, that year, the war is not going well for the Allies, to say the least. Uh, that month is when the Soviet Union, sorry, the Russians, back out. Lenin wins the Bolshevik Re Revolution on the promise that he'll pull the Russians out of the Great War. That means there is no Eastern Front anymore to the Great War, which means the Germans uh, and so on can all just attack, the Ottomans can attack the French, the English, the Canadians, and now the Americans. So they got a huge advantage. So what do you do? You panic and you overdo it. And they overdid it the ship called the Mount Blanc, which is 20 years old. It's not made for this, but already 5,000 ships have been sunk by 300 German U-boats, the first tactical submarines the world has ever seen. These are amazingly efficient and amazingly effective. Without them, the Germans would have lost the war. They also sunk not only uh, military ships, but also civilian ships like the Lusitania, of course. So they're going after all these ships, and now you got this old creaking ship that they have in Brooklyn in Gravesend Bay, which is beautifully named in Brooklyn, New York. 
and they load this ship with six million pounds of what's called uh, high explosives. All right, six million pounds, by the way, is 13 times the weight of the Statue of Liberty. This is a bad idea. All right, you're freaking out at this point. This is a really bad idea. What is a high explosive? Well, a low explosive uh, is gunpowder or gasoline. If you light it, it burns more or less slowly, all right, and it needs oxygen to work at all. You can put out a fire very easily by, of course, denying it oxygen. In TNT and picric acid, the two main high explosives on the ship used to make German shells to bomb the Germans, the oxygen mo molecule is included in the bigger molecule, which means all you have to do is bump this stuff one little bit and it will blow up. It does not need oxygen to ignite. If you're at a, a lab at the University of Michigan, and I've seen these labs, if you've got a bottle of picric acid, they'll train you for weeks on how to handle that bottle of picric acid. It is dry, it's got one granule of picric acid in the neck of that bottle, and you twist the cap of that bottle, we will blow up this entire room. All right, that is how explosive this stuff is. You've got six million pounds of it on one ship. And they know, they know the stevedores loading this thing 24 hours a day, night and day, with police guards there in the harbor, uh, working for a month to load up at all on one ship the size of a football field. They know how dangerous this stuff is. So they cover their boots in canvas to make sure their steel-toed boots never hit a spark. Uh, they cover everything in tar and plywood to make sure nothing bumps against metal on metal. They use copper nails because they know that copper is the, one of the few metals that does not spark when struck. They know that one spark sends the whole thing up. That's how paranoid they are about this, and they should be. And then, the day before the ship sets sail, the French government asks at the last minute for 400 barrels of benzol airplane fuel. They say, sure. And they put that on the bow and the stern of the ship, all right, exposed, carelessly lashed, uh, three and four barrels high. That, they have just built the perfect bomb. That is the fuse of your bomb. And they didn't realize they did this, of course, at the time, but that's what they just created. So there's your bomb, and now you've got to float it up to Europe. How do you get it there? You stop at Halifax on the way, because you're so paranoid about you both, you want to join a convoy in Halifax for protection to get across the river, get across the ocean, sorry. Uh, to Bordeaux, France. So they finally get, after three or four days on choppy season, they're nervous about any one wave blowing them up. And you can't have a match on the ship, you can't have a cigarette, nothing on board like that. Uh, they finally get up after four days of rocky water. They get into the Halifax Harbor, or so they think. But Halifax Harbor, every night, they have two fences going across the harbor underwater to keep the U-boats out at night. Otherwise, the U-boats go in, and you're all sitting ducks all right, dozens, even 100 ships, World War I and World War II, are in that basin, which is one mile by two miles. You can fit a lot of ships in there. If a U-boat gets in, you're just plunking them all down left and right. Can't have that. So one fence goes across, and the other fence goes across. It normally closes at 5 o'clock at night. But the harbor master that night has got a party he wants to go to, so he shuts it down at 4.30, and the Mont Blanc gets there at 4.45 cannot get in. You have to spend one more sleepless night at McNabb Island outside Halifax, paranoid about the Germans plunking you. If they catch that ship, the whole thing goes up, obviously. Finally, at 8 o'clock in the morning the next day, the fences come down. They scoot into Halifax Harbor very nervously. And once they're finally in the harbor, they think, ah, finally, we're safe. We have made it. We have the treacherous part coming up, but for three or four days, we're going to be okay. And as they scooch into the harbor very carefully, very slowly, on the right-hand side of the harbor, as you're supposed to, this is Traverse City. You people know nautical conventions, of course. You pass, of course, on the right. Uh, they're scooching along. Another ship in the basin called the Emo, a Norwegian relief ship. It is empty. It is supposed to go to New York the opposite direction to get relief supplies, bandages, anesthesia, all these things to help those who've been bombed in World War I. All right? But it's late. The day before, the call shipment came late, and the fences came across again early on the emo. So this guy is impatient to leave. He's a hothead. He's also a jerk, it turns out. Uh, as you'll read in the book, he's a hothead. He's had all kinds of legal problems over the years uh, as the captain of the ship. And he is eager to get out, and he has no idea. No one has any idea what is on the Mont Blanc except for the harbor master and three other people in the harbor, in the harbor house. No one else on land or on sea has any idea, and they're too afraid to raise the red flag for munitions, which they should have done once they're inside the harbor. And if they had done that, the whole harbor stops. 
and waits for that ship to go to, to, go to its port. But they didn't do that, so no one knows it's on it. And as the Mont Blanc scooches along, the emo is uh, trying to get out as fast as possible. You guys here know what a no-wake law is, all right? They've got a no-wake law in Halifax during this time. You're supposed to putz along. This guy is going 12 knots, about as fast as a ship can go. It's about 13 or 14 miles an hour, which is fairly fast for a boat. You can see the white foam billow on the bow, and you guys know when you see that, that boat is going too fast. So this guy is not only going too fast, he's so impatient, he passes the ships in front of him on the left, and on the left again, and on the left. If you keep on doing that, as you might passing cars here in the two-lane road in the county, all right, sooner or later, you're going to find a truck in your lane coming your way, all right, if you keep on taking that chance. That is exactly what happens on the morning of December 6th, 1917, in Halifax. And when he sees, when the Mont Blanc captain sees the emo barreling around the bend for the first time through the morning fog, he cannot believe what he's seeing. He's aghast. He turns ashen. He can't move. He's paralyzed till finally the harbor pilot nudges him and says, you need to act. So the man pulls one blast on his whistle. Meh. And that's nautical language for, I am in the right. Uh, I'm on the right course. You've got to respond to me. And the email comes right back with two blasts, which means, screw you, I don't care. <laughs> and then the emo, the Mont Blanc can't believe it, so once again, one blast on his horn, and saying, I'm not kidding, I'm in the right lane, I'm doing the right thing, you've got to go around me. And once again, the emo going full blast, slowing down, not at all, has two blasts on the horn, saying again, screw you, I don't care. And by now, you're about 500 feet apart. And this one's going up three miles an hour, and this one's going about 12 miles an hour. It's a game of chicken, but only one guy knows that they're all about to blow up. And that's the Mont Blanc captain. What do you do if you're playing a game of chicken and you realize the guy you're going against is crazy? At some point, you don't care what the law says. You're going to bail on either side of the road just to get out of the way, no matter what it is. And that's what the Mont Blanc does. The last second, he goes hard to port, hard to the left-hand side, peels out his bow to the center of the harbor. At the exact same moment, the emo comes to his senses and does the exact same thing. So now the emo bumps into the Mont Blanc. Not a big collision. They're both trying to reverse it by then as hard as they can, but you guys have been in boats. It, they're not brakes, man. They don't work like that. So you try to reverse it as fast as you can. They still bump. It's not a big collision. Small potatoes by the standards of the harbor during this time. It was pure chaos in Halifax during the war. All right, but it's enough to make a metal gouge in the bow of the Mont Blanc, it's enough to knock over the gallons, the barrels of Benzel airplane fuel. And now you've got a fire on the bow of the Mont Blanc. What did they do? They got in the two rowboats, crew of 40, and rowed out of there as fast as they could the other direction from Halifax. Halifax has got 50,000 people in it, about the same size as Traverse City. They go across to the woods of Dartmouth, across the, across the harbor, and run into the woods as fast as they can. They did one noble thing on the way. They told no one else about what was happening. They were yelling, explosion, explosion, to, ex to each other, which someone else overheard on the harbor. I'll get back to that in a second. But otherwise, they saved nobody. They didn't tell anybody about it. They didn't warn anybody. Clearly a moral failing. All right? But when they see the Mi'kmaq tribe, the, we would call Native Americans, they call them First Nation in Canada, he sees a mom out there with her, uh, with her baby. And he's trying to explain in French that the ship is about to blow up. And she, of course, is not understanding what he's saying. So he did one clever thing. He grabbed the baby out of her hand, snatched her, right, and started running into the woods, knowing full well any mom is going to chase that kid into the woods. So two people, at least, were saved. When they went into the woods, of course. They didn't tell anyone else about it. So the ship, 8.45 in the morning, is when the collision happens. The timing is cruel. Because at that hour, what is happening? Everybody is walking to work, and they're walking to school. The school's calendar that week only went from 9 o'clock to 9.30 start because of darkness, trying to make sure the kids are safe, walking to school in the morning. So they walked there a little later, and now they've got plenty of time to go down and see this burning ship in the harbor, which slides perfectly into Pier 6 at the base of Halifax in the neighborhood of Richmond, Nova Scotia. And it burns for 20 minutes, and imagine a ship out here in West Bay, all right, burning like that. If you didn't know what was on it, you'd go and watch it too. That's exactly what the people of Halifax did. Hundreds and then thousands of people watched the ship burn for 18 minutes. And one guy out there in the harbor overheard 
the French crew yelling, explosion, explosion. And he hears this, he figures out what's happening, and he goes as fast as he can into Halifax Harbor. He parks near uh, Pier 6, and he runs up the hill to the train dispatcher's office, the office of Vincent Coleman and his staff. His job is like uh, air traffic control, basically, make sure all the trains get in and out of the rail yard right in front of Pier 6 on time and safely. So he's there in the harbor, and the Mount Blanc is 100 feet outside his window burning. You can see it. The guy busts open the door and says, there are explosives on the ship in Pier 6. You guys have to evacuate. That thing is going to blow up at any minute. And Vincent Coleman tells his staff, run. Get out of here. Move. And they start taking off for the hills, uh, run up the hill of Richmond, which luckily is banked, which is a help later on. And then Vincent Coleman starts running too. And then he stops because he remembers the number 10 train from New Brunswick is due in 10 minutes. It is going to park with 300 passengers right in front of Pier 6. And if the guy who busted through his door is right, they will get blown up. What do you do? Vincent Coleman stopped. And he then ran back to his office and started rattling off as fast as he possibly can on his Morse code machine, of course, the teletype, the following message. Hold up the train, he says to all stations anywhere in sight. Trying to get the message through. Hold up all trains. Ammunition ship afire in harbor. Making for Pier 6 and will explode. Then he adds, guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. And he was right. At 904.35 seconds, we know exactly when this happened, in one fifteenth of a second, faster than we blink. The hold of the epicenter of that ship, the temperature skyrockets to 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is seven times hotter than molten lava. The ship explodes in all directions, up, down, all around, at 3,400 miles per hour. That is seven times the speed of sound. This is the world's first weapon of mass destruction. It creates a cauliflower mushroom-looking cloud about two miles in the air. The ship, as big as a football field, as big as Thurlby Field, is disintegrated, atomized. The biggest piece we can find is about as big as this podium in front of me. That is all that is left of Mount Blanc. If you're anywhere near it, you weren't just killed, you were vaporized. There's no trace of you left on Earth. All right? Anyone in the second ring of people got flown half a mile in the water, you probably survived, or up the hill with a softer landing, you probably survived. We've got amazing testimonials from some of our main characters who have flown onto the hill and lived to tell about it. They all ended up with this uh, thick oil from the black rain. Once that two-mile cloud came crashing down with hot shrapnel and oil and explosives and you name it, it landed all over people, so they all looked unrecognizable. All right? The stuff in your hair, on your arms, glass shards everywhere, you name it, the whole thing was a mess. That all came down. And then, of course, my grandfather was right. The cannon flew three miles that way, and the anchor flew, flew four miles that way. It wiped out two and a half square miles of Halifax in a split second. A town of 50,000 people, 25,000 were homeless like that. Half the city is gone. 9,000 are wounded, and 1,600 are killed instantaneously. Now, of the 9,000, how many can you save? And the answer on paper would be none, because you've got bad weather coming in. The half the town is gone. The wires are all down. You can't communicate. All right? The doctors are also, I mean, half the doctors are also gone. Half the city's gone. All right? The hospitals are blown up. How many can you save? And that's the challenge for what happens next. But there's more. Because the ship blew up down as well as up, all right, 30 feet down, by the way, it parted the sea literally of Halifax Harbor. You can see the floor of the sea for about three or four seconds. All right, that in turn creates a tsunami all right, that rises up from that vacuum. And now you've got a 30-foot wave crashing into the shore of Halifax, much like here in Traverse City. So if you manage to get up to that hill, all right, more people will end up being drowned and pulled back into the harbor and killed that way. And then you've got the fires. Why? Because it's 8.45 in the morning when, when it starts burning and 9.04. Everyone went down around 8 o'clock that morning to start their furnaces, to heat their homes, and to make breakfast. And all those fires are burning, and they all live in two-story clapboard houses like you have here in Traverse City. Uh, and guess what? They're all on fire now. It is an inferno. It's a holocaust. It's horrible. And then that night, the worst blizzard in 10 years hits Halifax. 
16 inches of snow, and 40 mile per hour winds. That is the situation you're facing. All right, and then here's what comes, all the incredible stuff afterwards, the heroic stuff, one thing after the other. All right, the mayor of Halifax is out of town that day and is not aware of what's happening and will not find out about it for many hours after that. So the deputy mayor is now in charge, but he does not know this. He is walking a mile away to the city hall, still there, by the way, the city hall of Halifax. As he's walking to the city hall of Halifax, the explosion a mile away knocks him on his backside. When he gets up, he realizes, I am in charge. This man runs a clothing store. All right? He is not trained for this in any way, shape, or form. He's been a nondescript politician to that point, and now the rescue effort is on his shoulders. Incredibly, what he does is gather anybody he can in the city hall whose windows are also blown out a mile away. All right, city leaders, government people, he does not care, about 20, 30 people. Within 45 minutes, they form 15 committees to save the city, and the planning involved was stunning. These committees actually worked. They got the right people for them, doing the right things, everything from recovery to relief to rescue, you name it, from shoes to first aid. It was all dispatched within 45 minutes. And one guy joked, they did more in 45 minutes than they had in 45 years. <laughs> but they had to. And you'll read in the book, by the way, countless examples of strangers helping strangers at risk of their own life. And one of the stories, for example, two teenage boys are getting out of this mess. They're walking along and they're hearing a woman on a rooftop that is burning, all right, screaming. And she's there with her husband. And they're trying to figure out why she's screaming. And they realize because she is pregnant, she's holding an infant. All right, what can you do? You have to rely on two teenage boys you've never met before. And they're sitting there at the bottom of the house and they're saying, you have to throw us your baby. And she realizes they're right as the fire starts coming up the stairs and trapping them. You've got to throw your baby one floor down to teenage boys you've never met before in your life. And she does that, and that baby lived to be 97. So that's what heroism looks like. Furthermore, even though the lines are all down, and people have telephones at this point, some do at least, official buildings do, even though they got telephones and so on, those don't work, the telegram lines are down, but Vincent Coleman's telegram, that two-sentence telegram I told you about, that already got out before the explosion. That saves thousands of lives. That's what Vincent Coleman did. That message gets to all the train stations throughout Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and then the word gets down to the states, to Boston, to New York, to Washington, D.C. And it's going to be Boston that responds first, but I'll get to that shortly. When Joseph Bars gets the word, he's an hour away in Wolfville, home of Acadia University, home of his parents, who also run a grocery store. All right, the word gets out to a doctor friend of theirs in town, and he knows Joseph Bars. Fresh from World War I, knows first aid. And right then, of course, it's all hands on deck. They don't know what happened exactly. But they know it's all hands on deck, so he tells Barge, you're coming with me. Barge packs a bag in five minutes. He's on the train from Wolfville, about an hour into Halifax. When he got off in Halifax, he has seen the worst fighting the world has ever seen in Ypres, France, the epicenter of World War I. But when he got off the train in Halifax, right by Vincent Coleman's blown up uh, house, of course, he writes the following. Of course, we thought the news was greatly exaggerated. But when about half an hour later, an urgent call came for doctors and nurses, we began to think there must be something to it. When he gets off the train, he writes this. I saw some terrible scenes of desolation and ruin at the Western Front. But never did I see anything so absolutely complete as what I saw in Halifax. In that entire area of three square miles, there was not one stick or stone standing on another. Every house and building had just crumpled up, and the whole was a raging mass of flames. He only knows first aid, but it's all hands on deck. They assign him to Camp Hill Hospital, where he'd been recovering from his injuries himself. It's a soldier's hospital. The windows are blown out. Uh, the top floors are in trouble, but it's all they've got. He knows first aid. For three straight days, with almost no sleep at all, he's performing surgeries without anesthesia, because it's all hands on deck. They do so many surgeries, these scalpels get dull and can't cut paper. All right? That's how often they're doing this. Also, oculations are called eye removals. They, were, they would perform about 1,000 of these because everybody, for 18 minutes, went to their windows to watch the thing burn. This is not safety glass back then. These are glass shards. All right? So the practice of uh, op ophthalmology greatly advances during this time because doctors from all over came to help. So what happens next? At 
A slightly more than one hour after the explosion, word gets to Governor McCall, Samuel McCall, at the State House in Boston. So that's the legacy of Vincent Coleman. He decides on the spot. He, he telegrams back to Halifax, what do you need? No response. He, he uh, sends him another message. What do you need? No response. They then meet at Faneuil Hall, of course, where Frederick Douglass and Samuel Adams and all the great Americans have spoken at some point or other. They meet in Faneuil Hall and instead of the 100 city leaders in Boston at that moment to send two trains, two ships, 100 doctors, 300 nurses, a million dollars worth of supplies, which is $20 million a day, all without being asked instantly. And they send it all at that moment because there's no response from Halifax. And that is the first help to arrive all right, the next day. Before Montreal, before Toronto, before any other major Canadian city helped out, Boston helped out. And don't forget, six years earlier, it was Americans talking about violently overthrowing Canada. So you can't say we're allies at that point, only technically in World War I. That's the help they send. Why? Because humanity trumps all. We don't care about your politics, your nationalities, your policy. You are in trouble, and we are in a position to help, so we're going to help. That is the American spirit, in my opinion, at its absolute best. <laughs> but it's not going to be easy, because that blizzard I mentioned with 16 inches of snow and 40 mile per hour winds, when you're taking the train up to uh, Nova Scotia, you've got to do a bend. Um, at Follies Pass, by the way, appropriately named, uh, Folly Mountain, all right, and what happens in mountains, of course, you guys know this up here. In the crevice, all the snow gathers, of course, off the mountain. They've got 16-foot drifts, and finally, at midnight of that first night, all right, with all the exposed buildings in Halifax and everybody suffering horribly, of course, uh, the train can't go any farther, and the conductor goes to Kat Ruchensky, who started the, uh, the Red Cross in Boston, a great patron, uh, the captain comes to Cap Ruchetsky and says, we cannot go any farther. We're stuck. And Ruchetsky gives one of the great speeches of all time when he stands up and says, whatever we are facing here, the cold, the discomfort, the fact that we're stuck here in a blizzard, can't possibly match whatever's happening in Halifax. They are bleeding. They are hurt. It's burning there also. They have no roofs on their heads. All right? They are far worse off than we are. We've got to find a way to get through. So what do they do? They have the local townspeople nearby grab their shovels. They grab shovels. The workers and the passengers get off the train. They start digging through 16-foot snow banks all right, on the train tracks. They pull the train back, and they ram it full blast into the snow bank. All right, to get as far as they can. They can't get all the way through, so they release the steam from the engines each time they do this, and it melts the snow around them. And they back up, and they dig some more, and they ram it in there again. They back up, they dig some more, and they send the train in again. They keep doing this three, four, five times. They're working so hard for an hour and a half, two hours, the workers, they're taking their coats off, their gloves off, their hats off. They're in the middle of a blizzard, working in T-shirts. They're working that hard. Everyone's giving everything they can. So they're plowing through this thing, and finally they bust through the other side, and the train erupts in cheers. The townspeople cheer. They hop on the train, and they're going to get there to Nova Scotia, to Halifax, first thing in the morning. When they get there in the morning, Kaprichansky has got a letter from the governor of Massachusetts, who's, by the way, lieutenant governor, it's a guy named Calvin Coolidge, and that will matter later. So they get there, and he hands the official in charge of the recovery in Halifax the letter from the governor of Massachusetts. And it says the following. The guy reads the letter in front of Kaprichetsky. I need hardly say to you that we have the strongest affection for you and the people of your city, and that we are anxious to do everything possible for their assistance at this time. And when he finishes reading the letter, the Stoic Canadian, all Canadians are Stoics, of course, he says, he starts crying in front of the man, and he says, just like the good old people of the United States. Eight years later, when Janet Kitts, a great biographer who's now in her mid-80s herself, and I got to know her quite well during my trips to Halifax, she did some great books of the survivors and interviewed them crucially. They're some of the heroes of my book. Uh, they're in their 70s and their 80s and the 1980s. There are kids when this happened. They're 10 and 5 and 15 years old when it happened. The first thing all of them mentioned was not the loss of their house, the loss of their family members, often their entire families, the loss of their businesses, the loss of all their wealth. The first thing every single one of the 20 people mentioned some 70, 80 years later was the help received from the Americans. That's the effect it had on the Canadian people. And back to Thomas Riddell, uh, a fantastic writer, a great historian. I never knew this guy until I started doing this work, and he's died about 20 years ago. He was a kid in Halifax when this happened, and ended up being the preeminent, in my opinion, 
uh, historian of Nova Scotia, a great writer, as I said. He wrote the following. Doctors and nurses arrived from the outlying provincial towns, and substantial help was on the way from Montreal and Toronto. But the first and most valuable assistance came from that ancient foe beyond the Bay of Fundy, Boston. Joseph Bars was no fan of Americans before this happened. This is a man, by the way, whose great-grandfather was the most wanted man in the United States. It is no surprise he's not the most pro-American guy you can meet. And of course, he's over there for a year getting shot at when the Americans are still at home, not yet in World War I. So that obviously rubbed Canadians the wrong way as well. Very quietly, I grant you they're Canadian, uh, but nonetheless. He wrote the following to his uncle after he got back from this trip. After three days of operating on these people without anesthesia, with uh, rough scalpels, he's relieved by his duty, all right, three days later by a team of doctors from Harvard, from Boston, who relieve him of his duties and pack him on the train and tell him to go home and get some sleep. On the train ride home, he writes, I tell you, we will never be able to say enough about the wonderful help the states have sent. The response was so spontaneous and everything done even before it was asked for. It brought tears to all our eyes when they came and told us a little of what had been done by the United States. You know, we've always been a trifle contemptuous of the United States on account of their prolonged delay in entering the Great War, but never again. They can have anything I've got, and I don't think I feel any differently from anyone else down here either. And he proved it. Those days changed Barr's life. Before that happened, he was not sure what he wanted to do with his life. He was lost. He knew business was not the answer for him. He did not want to be a pastor like his father or an educator like his grandfather, and not a privateer either. He didn't want to be a soldier. On the train ride home, he realizes he wants to be a doctor. So his uncle from Rochester, New York, sends him $100 and says, go to the University of Michigan. <laughs> I don't get that many chances for a cheap plug in a book like this. <laughs> and I talked to his son, who ended up being a good friend of mine. He passed away a few years ago. We stayed in touch for about 10, 15 years. I got to meet him out in Seattle on a book tour trip. A great guy, also a doctor. I said, how the hell did a guy from Wilfville, Nova Scotia, pick the, he's never been to the United States, let alone Ann Arbor, let alone Michigan, and so on. I said, how the hell did he pick Michigan? And he said, and I quote, I don't know, but it's always been a damn good school. <laughs> And that's in the book, because screw it. <laughs> it's my book. So he goes to Ann Arbor. He does not even have the prereqs necessary to get into medical school. He's got to spend a year learning how to work a lab uh, to get enough grades. It's very tough for him to do so. He's still limping, of course, with a cane. But he gets into Michigan Medical School in 1919. One of his classmates happens to be my great uncle, Joshua Bacon, whose son uh, lived here in Traverse City the last 10 years of his life. Uh, lived at the Park Place and on the peninsula for a while. Uh, so in the graduating class of 1923 at Michigan's Medical School, you see Joshua Bacon and two people later, Joseph Bars. In between is the great-grandfather, one of my best friends, Joe Brakey. So it's a small world. Uh, while he's trying to learn the labs and going to medical school and so on, he forced himself to skate on the rudimentary rink that Michigan had at that time, uh, with only three walls on it, not even four walls, because he wanted to learn how to walk again. He's determined to prove the doctors wrong. But each time he skated on the rink, it was so painful, tears came down his face. Tough guy, he kept doing it, and he kept doing it, and kept doing it, until finally he realized, I can skate again, I can do this, and I can walk. So then he walks down to Fielding Yost's office, the fam famous football coach, and of course, athletic director, and says, you need a hockey program. He says, you're right, but only if you're the first coach. And that is how the University of Michigan got a hockey program. He kept skating in five years as a head coach while a medical student, while married, while having two kids. This guy who had more ambition than most, of course. He ended up being a pioneering doctor in his field in Chicago. Um, in five years, they won two league titles, enough for Fielding Yost to add a fourth wall to the rink, add artificial ice, right before the Great Depression made that impossible. And that is why Michigan and Minnesota are the only two schools uh, in the Midwest that have had hockey programs since 1923. And that's all Joseph Bars is doing. Uh, he married Helen Kolb from Battle Creek, and he became an American citizen, which is quite a turnaround. In his life, you can see the arc of U.S.-Canadian relations during that time. Because he started the hockey program, my friend Ross Childs, I see her here in the front row, ended up going from Owen Sound, Ontario, uh, to Ann Arbor to become a goalie at Michigan. His son Scott and I were best friends. 
I started playing hockey because of Ross, and that's how I spend my summers here in Traverse City, going to the Glacier Dome. It is a small world. <laughs> what are the lessons that we learned from the Great Halifax Explosion? First of all, when the world delivers its worst, people often are at their very best. It is simply not true that we all start scavenging and uh, pilfering and whatnot. These people did not do that. There are two examples of people looting uh, during this entire time, incredibly. Uh, Vincent Coleman stands out to me as a great hero, and he's finally, 100 years later, getting the recognition he deserves in Halifax. The Americans, of course, they became our greatest ally during this time. Uh, and what does that mean to us? It means to us, by the way, if you ask somebody at a bar downtown at the UNI or whatever else, and ask them, who is America's biggest trading partner? You're probably going to hear China or Germany or Japan, maybe Mexico. Canada buys more from us every single day than Germany, China, and Japan combined. And Americans don't know that. Every day on the Ambassador Bridge between Windsor and Detroit is the world's busiest border point. $500 million of goods cross that bridge alone. Not the tunnel, not the ships, just that bridge, $500 million a day. All right, so without Canadians, we'd be in bad shape, and vice versa is true, too, of course. But what I really take away from this thing is the extraordinary heroism of the ordinary people. And one minor example I cannot resist telling you uh, is of a barber in Truro, Nova Scotia. It's about an hour away from Halifax. Of course, when the explosion happened, a lot of guys like Joseph Barr took the trains into Halifax to help out. But also, a lot of people in Halifax realized you can't get enough help here. So as many people as they could got on the trains, covered in the oily soot and the shrapnel and whatnot, often blinded. They'd get on the trains and get medical help on the train as it rolled along. Surgeries were performed on those trains, incredibly. All right, as they go to Truro and Windsor and other towns in Nova Scotia, uh, including the Driscoll brothers. They lost a brother. They lost their father. Uh, but their mother took them on the train to go to Truro to get out of Halifax. When they get there, Truro, like all these other cities in Nova Scotia, was prepared to receive them, turned the county courthouse into a receiving area for the patients. People took them in, uh, the people who were able-bodied, like these two boys, and they're sleeping on their beds in the farmhouses and so on of Truro. Every day these kids would get up, and they'd have black soot on the white pillowcases because the stuff, you couldn't get it out, the thick oil and uh, explosives and so on, uh, until finally their mom gave them a dollar which back then would buy you two haircuts, and said, go downtown and get a haircut. These boys are 12 and 10. And so they go down there to get a haircut. They're in the two chairs. And as the barber is clipping uh, Noble's hair, uh, Noble says, ouch. And the barber looks more closely, and he sees a glass shard and a bunch of glass shards in the back of his head, which is pretty common at the time. And the barber, by that basis alone, says, ah, you must be from Halifax. He knew. And then he walks over to the other barber, and they whisper to each other a uh, private message, and the two boys have no idea what they said. And they go back, and the two barbers tell the other customers waiting, no more appointments today, I need to come back tomorrow, we're taking care of these boys from now on. So the other customers leave, and the barbers wash their hair once, they wash their hair twice, they pluck with their tweezers, they're skilled with their hands, they pluck the glass shards, the metal shards, you name it, out of their heads, and shampoo them up properly, finally, and then they finally cut their hair. And then the whole time, Novo is amazed by how much better, of course, he feels. But then he starts feeling guilty, knowing there's no way in hell that $1 covers uh, a two-hour procedure for two boys. And so finally, at the end of the whole procedure, he very sheepishly gets out of the chair and hands the barber a dollar. And the barber smiles and waves off the dollar and says, come with me, laddie. And they take him across the street to a clothing store and out of their own pockets buy them a new wardrobe. And why I, I'm getting choked up myself. I've been telling the story for a year. You think I get used to it by now. And why I love the story is this. Those kids never learned the, name of the names of those barbers. All right? We don't know the names of those barbers to this day. But I know this 101 years later. We're not talking here tonight about the terrorists and the gunmen and all the other bad guys we read about. We're talking about two barbers in Truro, Nova Scotia, 101 years ago, who did the right thing when nobody was watching. And they had no idea that 101 years later, we'd be talking about them in Traverse City, Michigan. And that's what I want to say. When the laws no longer applied, basic decency proved even stronger. 
Because of them, against all odds, the survivors found ways to overcome their staggering losses and lead productive, fulfilling lives, even happy ones. The lives of the survivors and how they appreciated everything that happened. My friends who have interviewed them say they're the sweetest, nicest people you've ever met because they know what real trouble looks like. They don't complain about small things the way we often get in traps of doing. Now, the bigger picture. I told you about the U.S.-Canadian relations. In 1918, uh, the year after the explosion, Halifax sent the best uh, pine tree they could find in the province to Boston as a thank you, which they raised in Boston Common, the world's, the nation's, sorry, oldest park, created in 1634, as a thank you for all the great deeds done by Boston during this time. In 1976, our bicentennial, uh, which used to be, again, their idea of a civil war, they sent Boston another tree, 50-foot spruce, from Nova Scotia on a truck to thank them again for the help they gave in 1917. They've done it every year since. It's now been 42 years. It cost the people of Nova Scotia, the taxpayers, $180,000 to do that every year. And Nova Scotia is not exactly a wash in money, I must tell you, uh, compared to Toronto and Montreal and so on. Uh, and when the tree comes, it was delivered yesterday, by the way, to the people of Boston. It still happens to this day. They light it. It's a big ceremony. But I've been there for this tree lighting ceremony, and I had to tell the people of Halifax, I've met the mayor and I've met the provincial governor, and I said, I've got to tell you, and I hate to tell you this, but most folks in Boston have no idea where that tree comes from or why you're sending it down there. And the lady told me, why? she said, I don't care. Why should we stop thanking them? And that, to me, is the example of a great relationship. So that tree is a testament to a time when the worst the world could inflict brought out the best in two countries. In the process, it forged a hard-earned friendship, one strong enough to overcome 141 years of distrust, animosity, and occasional violence, one that has stood for a century as an example to the rest of the world. Thank you. We have time for a question. Thank you very much, by the way. It's very kind. By the way, when you write books for a living, you write them in a cafe by yourself for about a year. All right? And you don't know if anything's interesting or not, and you work in solitude. And even when the book comes out, this was a national bestseller. We get a great response, both in Canada and the US. Uh, but when you read the book and you respond positively, I might see uh, a, a review on Amazon. Those things help. All right? But that's about all you're going to get out of the whole thing. You know, some 40, 50,000 books have been sold. We might get 200 reviews, maybe. So almost everyone responds privately. It is wonderful. I can't tell you how much it means to people like Doug and me. When we come to a place like this and you hear the applause, trust me, it feels amazingly good. <laughs> uh, so thank you. All that time alone paid off, so I appreciate that. So we've got time for a few questions here, and then I'll sign your books out there. Hey, Dean Lucier, a fellow Michigan hockey player, by the way. By the way, Ross Childs, I'm sure you guys know Ross. The Kane brothers, there you go. I got an email saying you guys were in Florida. What the hell happened? You flew back earlier? You canceled the trip, and here you are tonight. So I got an email yesterday saying they're in Florida, and I see Ross right there. So pretty cool. Uh, OK, questions, sir? Thank you. The, the crew of the Mont Blanc, what happened to them, of course, that's a popular question, as you might imagine. Uh, they hid out for a few days. Um, they were finally brought to four different trials. Uh, two, the first two in Halifax, which are kind of jury-rigged, frankly, by a judge who did a pretty poor job. Anti-French sentiment in Nova Scotia at the time was very high because the French did not want to join the war. They had no particular love, as you might imagine, for the British crown. They don't answer the British crown as such, but they are British subjects. So they're not enthusiastic about World War I, whereas most of the Anglos were very enthusiastic about it, like Joseph Bars. So given the anti-French sentiment, uh, all the blame was put on them in the first uh, two court proceedings in Halifax, which they screwed up. There's no question about it. And their actions afterwards, I think, compounded their guilt. Here's, how, here's my take, and it's in the book. My take is, in the first place, 
Yeah, they should have put up the flag, but so many mistakes were made by so many people, I can't put this on them. The email was far more to blame nautically, uh, based on nautical conventions and laws, than the Mont Blanc was. However, then the guilt comes up bit by bit in small ways. First, you're on that ship, and you hop on the rowboats, and you take off. I can understand that to a point, because everyone thinks the ship's going to go up in any split second. No one thinks it's going to matter where you go. All right, so, okay, I might give you that, although it's worth noting that Vincent Coleman had the exact same choice and made the exact opposite decision. So other people did other things, in fairness. But then you go to the woods of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, across the, um, across the bay, and you watch the ship burn for 18 minutes, and you tell nobody. All right, at some point, you've got to realize this is a problem. At least go around the land and start spreading the word as best you can. If someone had done that, they might have saved a lot of people. All right, and then after the explosion, these guys not only did nothing for anybody, they never expressed any remorse their entire lives. And while you have people from Boston, from Toronto, from Battle Creek, Michigan, a doctor left the Kellogg Center in Battle Creek to work there for a month and a half all right, at his own expense. Guys from Chicago helped out. St. Louis sent money. Okay, the Prince, of, uh, Prince Edward, all right, the future king, of course, of Great Britain, who loved Halifax, he sent money. So that's where the guilt compounds bit by bit by bit, in my opinion. That's my personal take. You may not share that, but that's my take. Uh, so they are guilty of some things, but not of screwing up in the first place. That's not fair. Uh, the Emo is far more guilty. The captain and harbormaster of the Emo were killed instantly. That ship, which is bigger than Mont Blanc, was flown a half a mile and beached on the other side of the harbor. You can see the photo in the book, in the book by the way. It's tilted on its side, and those guys were killed instantly. So that was the rough justice there, I guess. Um, but they're more guilty about that. So the first two were anti-French, uh, the first judges. Then it goes to Ottawa, where you've got three Anglo judges and two French judges. And two of the Anglo judges found the Mont Blanc completely guilty. Again, that's not accurate. All right? But a third English judge split the difference, said it's both of them, All right? which is about right, I suppose. The two French judges thought, no, it's the emo who created this accident, not Mont Blanc, which I think is accurate. All right? But they knew the way the law works in Canada at that time, if these two judges said that, no, it's the emo entirely that was to blame, then you got to draw, two, two, and one. And the original court proceeding, that ruling therefore stands, and the Mont Blanc will be in prison at that point. So they very cleverly decided to say, nope, they're both equally to blame. Now you've got three votes saying half and half, and two votes saying Mont Blanc. The three votes win, and it's half a loaf, basically. And then it goes to London two years later for the Admiralty Court in London, and they find with the Ottawa Court that it's basically half and half. Uh, but they're never imprisoned, and I can live with that, I guess. Uh, what I can't live with is 20 years later, uh, Captain Rene Lemadec, the captain of Mont Blanc, received a Lifetime Achievement Award by the French Navy for his great duty to the French Navy during those years with no mention whatsoever of the Mont Blanc. That's not right. So that's my take. Sorry that was unsatisfying. But that's life, unfortunately. Other questions? We've got time for a few more. And then, of course, I'll sign your books out there, by the way. We've got, I think, about 500 books, thanks to Horizon and so on. People, by the way, are very apologetic about getting their books signed. They always say, do you mind signing these five books? Do you mind buying them? <laughs> <laughs> I got an easy deal. You buy them, I sign them. Okay? That's... <laughs> Writing books is really hard. Signing them is really easy. So don't worry about that. Yes, sir. Oh, qu here. Sorry, wait for the microphone because you guys are on tape. So. You uh, mentioned the cannon being four miles in the anchor being three miles away, are they displayed anywhere? They are. As a matter of fact, the shaft of the uh, anchor uh, is on display where it landed. Um, and it's pretty cool, actually. It's actually in a residential neighborhood, so kids are playing around this thing. But that shaft, man, you cannot pick it up, trust me. Uh, it's about, about this far, it's about that thick, and it's cast iron, so it's not going anywhere. Um, and you see the immense power of this thing. It's across the bay is where it landed. Um, so it's pretty incredible. Um, so yes, it's still around. Question up here. We're up, we're over here. Where, sorry? To your left. To up my high. left. Oh, way up there. A balcony helps. There we go. Hello there. Hi. Hi, Mr. Bacon. Uh, you mentioned about Calvin Coolidge being, a, I think you said, deputy mayor? Or Lieutenant governor of or Massachusetts. Governor. Okay. And, and the other thing I heard on the Ron Jolly show is that they're thinking about making this into a movie. Can you elaborate on both of those? I'm thinking about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> go blue. I 
I just need to get some folks to agree with me. That's the idea. So. Uh, but uh, Rob Lowe has expressed some interest. Um, there's a Sony executive vice president who seems intrigued. Um, it does seem to have the makings of a cinematic. You've heard the story. It's pretty cinematic, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, Rob Lowe is on Jimmy Kimmel's show in the spring. And in his latest movie, he actually gets the Halifax explosion snuck into his latest movie, which you might have seen, which has nothing to do with the Halifax explosion whatsoever. But he managed to sneak this in. And Kimmel asked him why. He says, I'm obsessed with the Halifax explosion. And I said, me too. <laughs> so luckily, I'm at William Morris Endeavor, which is, runs like a third of Hollywood, basically. Uh, they're my literary agents in New York. And I got Hollywood agents in Hollywood. And I told her about this, Anna DeRoy, my Hollywood agent. And she also did Boys in the Boat. She does a lot of big movies. And I sent her some copies for Rob Lowe. And he said he's reading it with interest. So we'll see how much interest he or anyone else has got. But I'm holding out hope. I'm trying to be Doug Stanton, damn it. So. <laughs> He's a hard man to catch. <laughs> Dean Lucier, who played hockey for Michigan. Not only in the US, but in Canada as well. That's more shocking. Go ahead, repeat that question. Sorry, Dean, for the microphone. You know, why do you think that uh, history has lost sight of it for so long, uh, both in the US and Canada? It's a great question, and it's rather shocking to me. Uh, that once you read this thing, the most common reaction I get is, I cannot believe I never knew about this before. Given the extraordinary dimensions of it uh, and how it, the ripples are still with us today, it's, I met Dean Lucier basically through the Halifax explosion. Without Michigan hockey, I don't meet Dean. So uh, that's how that one works. Dean played in the 60s for the team. Um, I think two reasons. One, in the US, two pretty simple answers. One, it's World War I, which we study one-tenth as much as we study World War II. World War I, we got in too late. It's got a very unsatisfying conclusion. It leads to World War II. It's basically the Vietnam of 1917. People don't want to talk about it that much. Two, it's Canada, which, like Dave Barry said, technically a nation. Uh, so we know very little about Canada, sad to say. Uh, so that's part of the deal, too. Third, because it's Canada, they're a lot more quiet about this than I think we would be. Um, I mean, I've been to the 9-11, of course, monument. The, not monument, the whole uh, thing, of course. And it's quite impressive. And, um, Canada, Canadians don't do that. There's barely a monument in Halifax to this. Now, they finally got a pretty good one on the hill uh, where the people were flown, uh, and they looked down and saw the, a straight line down to Pier 6. On Pier 6, about 10 years ago, they sold that land to Irving Oil, for crying out loud, to make a big boathouse where they make boats. It's this big old white garage, basically. It's ugly. Uh, and they could have moved it a quarter mile down and made no difference whatsoever. Uh, that galls me, frankly, for all the great work of Vincent Coleman and others uh, during this time. If you go to the uh, Maritime Museum in Halifax, they did a great job there. They're a big help to me on this book. Uh, but the bigger display is of Titanic, because Titanic, five years earlier, uh, the rescue mission was sent from Halifax, and they brought the bodies back to Titanic. Uh, 300 of them are buried um, in the Halifax Cemetery, along with the Halifax explosion victims. So James Cameron, when he's researching Titanic, the great movie, uh, he's Canadian also, by the way, he spends his time in Halifax. The opening scenes and the closing scenes of Titanic, the movie, where the then old lady is in the boat talking about it, that's Halifax Harbor. That's the basin we're talking about where the explosion happened. All right? And it's a much bigger deal, Titanic, than it is the Halifax explosion, which makes no sense to me because that is your history. All right? And it's also it's great history. It's an example, again, of Haligonians, as they're called, and Canadians and Americans at their absolute best. So why we don't celebrate this more uh, is, is frustrating to me, Dean. So I've got no good answer on that one. Uh, those, those are my guesses. So yes, sir. Got time? We've got a microphone up here. Oh, I'm sorry. You got one up there? Uh, you, you can, but it can't be recorded, unfortunately. So, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't remember how long ago it was, um, but quite a long time ago, I read a book called Burden of Desire by That's Robert right. McNeil. He's still of around. The McNeil uh, Lehrer News Hour, and it was about the great Halifax explosion. It was a love story and all of that, yep. but that was the background. And that's, that's how the only... That's about the only thing I've ever heard of it. Uh, 1993, Robert McNeil of the McNeil Lair Report, of course, on public PBS for all those years. He's a native Haligonian who grew up there in the 30s and 40s, 40s and 50s. He went to my uncle's prep school, actually, uh, in Nova Scotia. Um, he wrote a great novel called Burden of Desire, um, 1993, which is based around the Halifax explosion. It's fictionalized, but the events of the Halifax explosion are accurate. And I quote them sometimes, and Robert McNeil himself 
uh, in this book several times. Had a chance to interview him for this. He's in his 80s now and still doing quite well living in New York. Uh, I've not gotten his reaction to this book. Maybe I'm scared. I don't know. Uh, but I should. But yes, he's still around and did a great job on that. So, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, microphone. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and the microphone people, the volunteers, will get to you. You so. talked about writing in a cafe. Can you by stand your... up, please? Oh. Thank you. You talked about writing in a cafe for a year by yourself, and I just wondered how you approached going from sports writing to a historical event, if there was any difference in your research and your approach. Good question. You guys all heard that, of course, thanks to the microphone. Uh, first of all, the process, I, and here in town, I go to brew, and I go to morsels, uh, and now, uh, what's it called, Frenchies, something like that? I was there today, pretty cool. Uh, so you can often find me and Doug standing here in town. I'm in Ann Arbor at Sweetwater. I spent a lot of time in cafes. My kid is three years old. He goes, goes to daycare in Ann Arbor. And they ask, what, your, what does your dad do? And he says he works in a cafe. So, <laughs> I can't say he's wrong. <laughs> he shows up there and runs, daddy, daddy. And that's my writing break, of course. And what am I? I'm working in a cafe. So. There you go. Uh, and the question, of course, is uh, how does the process differ from sports to this? And the answer is not very much, believe it or not. Uh, it's pretty close. Um, the process is about the same. Uh, the difference, what you do is you do a lot of interviews. You do a lot of research. My wife, by the way, I forgot to praise her, that she's the one who read. I've got, we've got a bookshelf at home, a bookcase, sorry, with about 100 books about Halifax, about automobiles at the time, about explosives, uh, about World War I. I mean, you name it, whatever aspect of this we could cover, we covered uh, in this book. Um, I couldn't read 100 books in a year. Uh, so my wife read a ton of them and gave me great notes on these things. She's the one also who transcribed Joseph Barr's letters from World War I and Halifax. Uh, and of course, he writes in pen and ink back then, you know, scratching it out and so on, behind a tree of a war zone. And you can see his handwriting and his grammar deteriorate over time. And she had to slow her, you know, plot through these things. She's a great research assistant uh, during this time, research help. So thank you again for that, by the way. Um, so the process is you gather a bunch of stuff, uh, and then you start sifting through it. And as you start writing the process, you realize what you're missing, and you go find that. A dumb writer tries to do all the research first and then tries to write it. By then, you're screwed. Okay? You've got to start writing about halfway through, and your first draft is going to stink. All first draft stinks, it turns out. Uh, when I was living in Princeton, New Jersey at age 23 or 24 or so, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, their most famous dropout, I believe, of Princeton, uh, they had the first 20 pages of The Great Gatsby under glass as a testament to his great work, of course. It's one of the purest, smoothest novels ever written in English. It's phenomenal. It's that got a bad paragraph in it. And I read it already three or four times at that age, already a fan of his. So I said, okay, this would be cool. I'll go see the first draft and see what that's like. And I'm starting to read it, and I know the first few pages pretty well. And I was like, well, that seems a little off. And that seems way off. And you realize, this kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized, yes, it does suck. It's his first draft of eight drafts. All right? And for Halifax, I wrote 15 drafts. Uh, and that's the process that it takes. And as I teach at Michigan and Northwestern, I tell my students, everyone's first draft sucks. Your problem is you turn yours in. <laughs> So here's your C. <laughs> Try again. So the process is still maddening, it's still crazy, but it's not that much different. The real difference between this book and uh, my football books is that almost all these guys are gone, naturally. So I'm relying on other people's interviews. My interviews are with researchers and people have interviewed the people I want to talk to. Uh, so it's more static that way. I'll say one thing good about doing a book that's 100 years after the fact is nobody can sue you. They're all gone. <laughs> that was a relief. Uh, so when I'm doing a football book about you know, Dave Brannon or the Michigan Athletic Department, I talk to a lot of lawyers all right, during that time, and we cut out about 20% because it's just not worth it. Uh, whereas this book is like, have at it. So there we go. Uh, the people who did wrong in this book, I can say it and not worry about a thing. So that's the one main difference. So the answer is actually not much difference. And i got to thank HarperCollins. And my editor there, Peter Hubbard, who's a hotshot editor, he's only like 40 years old. He did American Sniper, which sold 5 million copies. I would like a slice of that. Um, and he's the one who took a chance on this football writer being able to write about history. And I had to write 50 pages as, a, as proof that I could as part of the pitch. But they took a big chance. And so I'm gratified that this book is hitting bestseller lists, that they got their money back, and now I can go do it again if I want to. Uh, so that, for me, is a great relief. So again, thank you <laughs> for buying these things. Yeah.
Yes. Last question. Way up top, balcony. And by the way, I'm gratified to see the balcony mostly, mostly full, by the way. This is great to see. So, Sir. Thank you. Uh, John, question for you. Was the harbor master complicit in this? Yes. Okay. Uh, was the harbor master what was the outcome other than incineration for that guy? Uh, he actually was punished quite severely. His, uh, Wyatt was the harbor master. Uh, he took more of the brunt. He took some of the brunt, and he should have, because again, he had no clear policy. And when the netting goes across the harbor, uh, he should have been aware, because they'd been telegrammed four days earlier about this ship coming up. All right, and you knew this ship is loaded like crazy with six million pounds of explosives. If you know that ship is coming up, I got news for you. Wait for it. All right, and wait a half an hour, and they can telegram in. They know it's coming in. They know when it's coming in. All right, so with that in mind, keep the harbor open to get these guys in safe harbor. If that had happened, we're not discussing this now. Uh, it's, it's nothing. Uh, so I think he was, he made some mistakes along the way. He failed to notify others. After it was burning, he should have been down in the harbor screaming to everybody that that thing's going to blow up and get out of here. All right, that would have saved more lives as well and more injuries as well. Um, most of his mistakes were honest mistakes. I will say, as you read the book, there are about 20 safeguards that were all removed one by one by one to get you to this point. And as you read it, it becomes more and more maddening when you realize if any one of these guys had done what they're supposed to do, it would not have happened. But everyone assumes during wartime, London and Paris, they don't care about the safety of people in Halifax. They're cared about lo they care about losing the Great War and speaking German the rest of their lives. So they're not too concerned about whatever the hell is happening in Halifax. So they just want to rush this stuff out. Safety is your problem. Uh, so that's kind of the deal in Halifax. Each guy who cut a corner in this case, this is a lesson for us all. Every guy who cut a corner in this situation assumed the other guys were not cutting the corner, and therefore my corner won't matter. And of course, when everyone cuts a corner, they all matter. And that's what happened there. So we have time for one or two more here. I don't know where Doug is, but uh, yes, question here. <laughs> There's Doug. I'm Lori. I drove here from Ann Arbor to meet you. Lori, you get your time to ask your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've read your book twice, loved it, but my big question is how did Halifax people get the nickname Haligonians? Uh, how did Halifax people get the nickname Haligonian? I think it's in the book, but it's brief. Uh, one of the, there are three or four theories about this. Uh, one of them is these guys drink like crazy. Uh, it is the, to this day, it is the drinkingest city in Canada. Dean, you've been to Canada. <laughs> That's got to impress you, by the way, on some level. Uh, that and the pubs from 200 years ago, from, uh, from uh, 1750s, are still active in Halifax. So the notion was, you had so many soldiers, it was always a military outpost from the start. That's how it was born, basically. You always got sailors in town drinking, you've always had prostitutes in town. They've got uh, the Citadel, this huge hill, with this eight-pointed star of a uh, garrison, basically, to keep everybody out of the harbor. This hill at night is pitch black, and it's so dark, of course, that the soldiers and the prostitutes would be on the hill having sex, and no one could bust them because they can't find them. All right. Uh, so from that came the, uh, uh, oh, what was the name? Um, it was a year ago I wrote this book, of course, a year and a half ago. Uh, the name of the street, oh, Knock 'em Down Alley. The main street right below, it came back to me, of the Citadel. It's called Knock 'em Down Alley because fights there were happening every single night. Good women would not come anywhere near this block, so they're called goons. All right. And then Haligonians, and then Haligonians. There you go. So we have time for, what, one more? One more. There we go. You came from Ann Arbor. You deserve that question. Thank you very much. So time for one more. Somebody up there. Who's got a mic already? Where are the, where are the mic folks? There we go. Somebody with a mic, get somebody with a hand, and we'll, we'll call it good. Somebody? I see a bunch of hands. Well, I have a question. Doug's got a question. Doug, ask your question. Thank you, get to the the Get to the mic. Get yeah. to the mic. So thank you so much. This has really been entrancing, hypnotic to hear you go through this. But what's next? What's next? Uh, I'm pretty sure I've got one more football book in me. I heard the jokes before I got up here. <laughs> uh, did you guys not see the basketball game for crying out loud? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was a whole lot more fun to watch, obviously. Uh, but uh, I think there's one more football book in me, and it's been a fascinating time to watch Jim Harbaugh and his uh, crew do their stuff. I'm not certain about that yet, uh, but I can say I go back to third grade with Jim Harbaugh, actually. We're on the squirt uh, all-star team, it turns out, that Ross Childs coached. Uh, and I'm number 14, and Jim Harbaugh's number 15, and we were later teammates on the 
Wilkinson Luggage travel team, uh, and one of us was a great athlete. <laughs> I'll leave it at that, but I've got good access to the program, so probably one more football book, and then I'm turning my attention to three or four other ideas that are unrelated to sports, uh, that are more nautical in nature and more historical in nature, so this has been a great thing for me to do, and I'll probably expand from there. So with Doug, uh, Doug himself getting the last question, uh, again, I cannot, if you guys don't buy these books, I would have to go back to law school, and that would really be horrible for everybody. Because <laughs> now I'm bitter with a law degree, and those guys can do a lot of damage, so... Uh, I want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart for supporting the National Writers Series. Thank you.